Section 29 of A Popular History of France, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cathy Barrett. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 31. Henry the Second, fifteen forty seven to fifteen fifty nine, part three. Irritated, and perhaps still more shocked, at so heavy a blow to his power and his renown, Charles V looked everywhere for a chance of taking his revenge. He flattered himself that he had found it in Terouan, a fortress of importance at that time between Flanders and Artois, which had always been a dependency of the kingdom of france and served as a rampart against the repeated incursions of the english the masters of calais charles knew that it was ill supplied with troops and munitions of war and the court of henry the second intoxicated with the deliverance of metz spoke disdainfully of the emperor and paid no heed to anything but balls festivals and tournaments in honour of the marriage between diana d'angouleme the king's natural daughter and horatio farnese duke of castro all of a sudden it was announced that the troops of Charles V were besieging Terouenne. The news was at first treated lightly. It was thought sufficient to send to Terouenne some reinforcements under the orders of Francis de Montmorency, the nephew of the constable, but the attack was repulsed with spirit by the besiegers, and brave as was the resistance offered by the besieged, who sustained for ten hours a sanguinary assault, on the 20th of June, 1553, Francis de Montmorency saw the impossibility of holding out longer, and on the advice of all his officers, offered to surrender the place. But he forgot to stipulate in the first place for a truce the germans entered the town thrown open without terms of capitulation it was given up as prey to an army itself a prey to all the passions of soldiers as well as to their master's vengeful feelings and terouanne handed over for devastation was for a whole month diligently demolished and razed to the ground when charles v at brussels received news of the capture quote, bonfires were lighted throughout flanders bells were rung cannon were fired end quote. It was but a poor revenge for so great a sovereign after the reverse he had just met with at Metz, but the fall of Terouanne was a grievous incident for France. Francis I was in the habit of saying that Terouanne in Flanders and Ac, now Dax, on the frontier of Guienne, were to him like two pillows on which he could rest tranquilly. Whilst these events were passing in Lorraine and Flanders, Henry II and his advisers were obstinately persisting in the bad policy which had been clung to by Charles VIII, Louis XII, and Francis I, that, in fact, of making conquests and holding possessions in Italy. War continued from Turin to Naples, between France, the Emperor, the Pope, and the local princes, with all sorts of alliances and alternations, but with no tangible result. Blaise de Montluc defended the fortress of Siena for nine months against the imperialists, with an intelligence and a bravery which earned for him, twenty years later, the title of Marshal of France. Charles de Brissac was carrying on the war in Piedmont with such a combination of valour and generosity that the king sent him as a present his own sword, writing to him at the same time, quote, The opinion I have of your merit has become rooted even amongst foreigners. The emperor says that he would make himself monarch of the whole world if he had a Brissac to second his plans. End quote. His men, irritated at getting no pay, one day surrounded Brissac, complaining vehemently. Quote, you will always get bread by coming to me, said he, and he paid the debt of France by sacrificing his daughter's dowry, and borrowing a heavy sum from the Swiss on the security of his private fortune. It was by such devotion and such sacrifices that the French nobility paid for and justified their preponderance in the state, but they did not manage to succeed in the conduct of public affairs, and to satisfy the interests of a nation progressing in activity, riches, independence, and influence." disquieted at the smallness of his success in italy henry the second flattered himself that he would regain his ascendancy there by sending thither the duke of guise the hero of metz with an army of about twenty thousand men french or swiss and a staff of experienced officers but guise was not more successful than his predecessors had been after several attempts by arms and negotiation amongst the local sovereigns he met with a distinct failure in the kingdom of naples before the fortress of civitella the siege of which he was forced to raise on the fifteenth of may fifteen fifty seven 
wearied out by want of success, sick in the midst of an army of sick, regretting over, quote, the pleasures of his field sports at Joinville, and begging his mother to have just a word or two written to him to console him, end quote, all he sighed for was to get back to France, and it was not long before the state of affairs recalled him thither. It was now nearly two years ago that on the 25th of October, 1555, and on the 1st of January, 1556, Charles V had solemnly abdicated all his dominions, giving over to his son Philip the kingdom of Spain, with the sovereignty of Burgundy and the Low Countries, and to his younger brother, Ferdinand, the empire together with the original heritage of the House of Austria, and retiring personally to the monastery of Just in Estremadura, there to pass the last years of his life, distracted with gout, at one one time resting from the world and its turmoil, at another vexing himself about what was doing there now that he was no longer in it. Before abandoning it for good, he desired to do his son Philip the service of leaving him, if not in a state of definite peace, at any rate in a condition of truce with France. Henry the Second also desired rest, and the constable of Montmorency wished above everything for the release of his son Francis, who had been a prisoner since the fall of Terouanne. A truce for five years was signed at Vaucelles on the 5th of February, 1556, and Coligny, quite young still, but already admiral and in high esteem, had the conduct of the negotiation. He found Charles V dressed in mourning, seated beside a little table in a modest apartment hung with black. When the admiral handed to the emperor the king's letter, Charles could not himself break the seal, and the bishop of Arras drew near to render him that service. Quote, "'Gently, my lord of Arras,' said the emperor, "'would you rob me of the duty I am bound to discharge "'towards the king my brother-in-law? "'Please, God, none but I shall do it.'" Quote. And then turning to Coligny, he said, quote, "'What will you say of me, admiral? "'Am I not a pretty knight to run a course and break a lance, "'I who can only with great difficulty open a letter?' Quote. He inquired with an air of interest after Henry the Second's health, and boasted of belonging himself also to the House of France through his grandmother Mary of Burgundy. Quote, I hold it to be an honour, said he, to have issued on the mother's side from the stock which wears and upholds the most famous crowns in the world. End quote. His son Philip, who was but a novice in kingly greatness, showed less courtesy and less good taste than his father. He received the French ambassadors in a room hung with pictures representing the Battle of Pavia. There were some who concluded that from that the truce would not be of long duration. And it was not long before their prognostication was verified. The sending of the Duke of Guise into Italy, and the assistance he brought to Pope Paul IV, then at war with the new King of Spain, Philip II, were considered as a violation of the truce of Vaucelles. Henry the Second had expected as much, and had ordered Coligny, who was commanding in Picardy and Flanders, to hold himself in readiness to take the field as soon as he should be, if not forced, at any rate naturally called upon, by any unforeseen event. It cost Coligny, who was a man of scrupulous honour, a great struggle to lightly break a truce he had just signed. Nevertheless, in January 1557, when he heard that the French were engaged in Italy in the war between the Pope and the Spaniards, he did not consider that he could possibly remain inactive in Flanders. He took by surprise the town of Lens, between Lille and Arras. Philip II, on his side, had taken measures for promptly entering upon the campaign. By his marriage with Mary Tudor, Queen of England, he had secured for himself a powerful ally in the North. The English Parliament were but little disposed to compromise themselves in a war with France. But, in March 1557, Philip went to London. The Queen's influence and the distrust excited in England by Henry II prevailed over the pacific desires of the nation, and Mary sent a simple herald to carry to the King of France at Reims her declaration of war. Henry accepted it politely but resolutely. Quote, I speak to you in this way, said he to the herald, because it is a queen who sends you. Had it been a king, I would speak to you in a very different tone, End quote. and he ordered him to be gone forthwith from the kingdom. A negotiation was commenced for accomplishing the marriage, long since agreed upon, between the young queen of Scotland, Mary Stuart, and Henry the second son, Francis, Dauphin of France. Mary, who was born on the 8th of December, 1542, at Falkland Castle in Scotland, had, since 1548, lived and received her education at the court of France, whither her mother, Mary of Lorraine, eldest sister of Francis de Guise, and Queen Dowager of Scotland, had lost no time in sending her as soon as the future union between the two children had been agreed upon between the two courts. 
The Dauphin of France was a year younger than the Scottish princess, but, quote, from his childhood, says Venetian Capello, he has been very much in love with her most serene little highness, the Queen of Scotland, who is destined for his wife. It sometimes happens that when they are exchanging endearments, they like to retire quite apart into a corner of the rooms, that their little secrets may not be overheard. End quote. On the 19th of April, 1558, the espousals took place in the great hall of the Louvre, and the marriage was celebrated in the church of Notre-Dame. From that time, Mary Stuart was styled in France Queen Dauphiness, and her husband, with the authorization of the Scottish commissioners, took the title of King Dauphin. Quote, Etiquette required at that time that the heir to the throne should hold his court separately, and not appear at the king's court save on grand occasions. The young couple resigned themselves without any difficulty to this exile, and retired to villers cotteret Whilst preparations were being made at Paris for the rejoicings in honour of the union of the two royal children, war broke out in Picardy and Flanders. Philip II had landed there with an army of forty-seven thousand men, of whom seven thousand were English. Never did any great sovereign and great politician provoke and maintain for long such important wars without conducting them in some other fashion than from the recesses of his cabinet, and without ever having exposed his own life on the field of battle. The Spanish army was under the orders of Emmanuel Philibert, Duke of Savoy, a young warrior of thirty who had won the confidence of Charles V. He led it to the siege of Saint-Quentin, a place considered as one of the bulwarks of the kingdom. Philip the Second remained at some leagues' distance in the environs. Henry the Second was ill prepared for so serious an attack. His army, which was scarcely twenty thousand strong, mustered near Laon, under the orders of the Duke of Nevers. At the end of July, fifteen fifty seven, it hurried into Picardy, under the command of the Constable de Montmorency, who was supported by Admiral de Coligny, his nephew, by the Duke of Enghien, by the Prince of Conde, and by the Duke of Montpensier, by nearly all the great lords and valiant warriors of France. They soon saw that Saint-Quentin was in a deplorable state of defence. The fortifications were old and badly kept up. Soldiers, munitions of war, and victuals were all equally deficient. Coligny did not hesitate. However, he threw himself into the place on the 2nd of August during the night with a small corps of 700 men and Saint-Rémy, a skilled engineer who had already distinguished himself in the defence of Metz. The admiral packed off the useless mouths, repaired the walls at the points principally threatened, and reanimated the failing courage of the inhabitants. The constable and his army came within hail of the place, and Dandelot, Coligny's brother, managed with great difficulty to get 450 men into it. On the 10th of August, the battle was begun between the two armies. The constable affected to despise the Duke of Savoy's youth. Quote, I will soon show him, said he, a move of an old soldier. End quote. The French army, very inferior in numbers, was for a moment on the point of being surrounded. The Prince of Conde sent the constable warning. Quote, I was serving in the field, answered Montmorency, before the Prince of Conde came into the world. I have good hopes of still giving him lessons in the art of war for some years to come. End quote. The valour of the constable and his comrades in arms could not save them from the consequences of their stubborn recklessness and their numerical inferiority. The battalions of Gascon infantry closed their ranks with pikes to the front, and made an heroic resistance, but all in vain, against repeated charges of the Spanish cavalry, and the defeat was total. More than three thousand men were killed. The number of prisoners amounted to double, and the constable, left upon the field with his thigh shattered by a cannon-ball, fell into the hands of the Spaniards, as was also the case with the dukes of Longueville and Montpensier, La Rochefoucauld, Daubigne, etc. The Duke of Enghien, Viscount de Touraine, and a multitude of others, many great names amidst a host of obscure, fell in the fight. The Duke of Nevers and the Prince of Conde, sword in hand, reached La Fere with the remnants of their army. Coligny remained alone in Saint-Quentin with those who survived of his little garrison, and a hundred and twenty arbusiers whom the Duke of Nevers threw into the place at a loss of three times as many. Coligny held out for a fortnight longer, behind walls that were in ruins and were assailed by a victorious army. At length, on the 27th of August, the enemy entered Saint-Quentin by shoals. Quote, the admiral, who was still going about the streets with a few men to make head against them, found himself hemmed in on all sides, and did all he could to fall into the hands of a Spaniard, preferring rather to await on the spot the common fate 
than to incur by flight any shame and reproach. He who took him prisoner, after setting him to rest a while at the foot of the ramparts, took him away to their camp, where as he entered he met Captain Alonso de Cazier, commandant of the old bands of Spanish infantry, when up came the Duke of Savoy, who ordered the said Cazier to take the admiral to his tent. End quote. Don de Lo, the admiral's brother, succeeded in escaping across the marshes. Being thus master of St. Quentin, Philip II, after having attempted to put a stop to carnage and plunder, expelled from the town, which was half in ashes, the inhabitants who had survived, and the small adjacent fortresses, Ham and Catelet, were not long before they surrendered. End of section 29